My purpose in writing you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan should not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and a door stood open for me in the Lord, I had no peace in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us triumphantly as captives in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God the sweet aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an odor of death and demise, to the other a fragrance that brings life. And who is qualified for such a task? For we are not like so many others who peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, as men sent from God. Father, bless me now as I teach from your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. For the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord, our God and King. Amen. Today, we begin the Pastor's Appreciation Series, given that it is October, and October is Pastor's Appreciation Month. Now, I am not one to celebrate my birthday or anything about me, yet here I am, celebrating Pastor's Appreciation Month. And the reason for that is because I have been very discouraged lately about the pastoral ministry in general. And the Lord told me, why don't you preach to encourage yourself? After much prayer and deliberation, I decided to go with it and to preach to myself for the purpose of encouraging myself through the Word of God. Because we have to remember, faith comes from hearing and the message is heard through the Word of Christ, according to Romans 10, 17. Now, today's title is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. And the title is, who is qualified for such a task? As you can tell, this is a rhetorical question, and the answer, simply put, is that no one is qualified for the task of being a pastor. Nevertheless, we need to look at this particular passage closely to determine the requirements needed to be a pastor. Now, I want to remind you, in Ephesians 4.11, it tells us that it was he it was the Lord Jesus who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Now, in the strictest sense of the word, an apostle is someone who witnessed the ministry and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. From this definition, I do not believe there are any more apostles today, even though some use the title loosely. Now, however, I do not believe you can use the title loosely because the biblical context does not allow you to use it loosely. Now, there are also those who claim to be prophets, but that too is a stretch. And I'm not saying no one can prophesy anymore. I'm not saying that. I am not a cessationist. I am a Pentecostal. However, if one is going to call himself a prophet, he better have a 100% track record. And of course, there are evangelists today, and these are the ones who go out into the world, into the communities, for the sole purpose of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the pastors and teachers are the ones who are left to disciple and grow new converts in Christ and to ensure that existing members disciple them into a deeper worship of Christ and conformity to His image. That is the job of the pastor to discipline every member of the church to be better followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the pastoral ministry is very challenging, so much so that the Barna Group in 2022 found that 56% of pastors have considered quitting due to the immense stress of the job. And another 43% considered quitting at one time or another because of feelings of loneliness and isolation. And I can identify with both. And that means 99% of pastors have considered quitting the ministry at one point or another. 
Now, going back to our text, we see that no one is qualified for the task of pastoral work. But if we look closer at the passage at hand, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 to 17, we can see four tests or expectations if one is to engage in the pastoral ministry. Now, remember, I am preaching this to myself. The first is the test of obedience, according to verses 9 to 11. The second is the test of persistence, verses 12 to 13. And the third is the test of resilience, verses 14 to 16. And the test of diligence, verse 17. Now, let's look at the test of obedience. Obedience to what? The Lord said in John 21, 15, Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs is the very first command regarding pastoral duties. And we see that in our passage today. 2 Corinthians, by way of a background, was written by the Apostle Paul in defense of him changing his mind about visiting the Corinthian church. You see, there was a rift between the Corinthian church and the Apostle Paul. And rather than personally confronting their actions, he thought it would be best to send Titus first to see how they are doing. So in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we see the Apostle Paul's purpose in writing them, and that is to see if they would stand the test and be obedient in everything. And here, the Apostle Paul exemplifies his pastoral duty to obey the Lord and feed them by preaching what is unpopular. The reason why there was a rift between Paul and the Corinthian church was because he had to rebuke them for their worldly actions of division, of sexual immorality, and the abuse of charismatic gifts. Not to mention that they were suing one another on top of that. So Paul had to rebuke them for that. And it is the pastor's duty to preach truth with grace and grace with truth. And preaching truth is quite unpopular then, and it is still unpopular now. Nevertheless, if I am to be a pastor obedient to Christ, I need to feed the sheep with grace and truth and truth with grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Yet when I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am obligated to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. What the Apostle Paul meant here in this verse is woe to him if he will water down the gospel. So pastor, as much as it is tempting to water down the gospel and make it palatable to the church, don't. Continue preaching the truth of the scriptures with grace and to preach grace with truth. But the pastor is also expected to practice what he preaches according to verses 10 to 11. Verses 10 to 11 reads, If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven. I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan should not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. In his prior letter to the Corinthian church, the Apostle Paul commanded them to deal with those, among other things, who are spreading dissension in the body of Christ, particularly against the Apostle Paul, who were questioning his apostleship. But here Paul tells them that he is willing to forgive the erring brother as he also encourages the rest of the Corinthian church to forgive the erring brother as well. As a pastor, I need to practice what I preach. And sadly, I am not always good at it. But I pray that I will get better in practicing what I preach. And that is such a high standard because in the end, I am accountable to God. Romans 2.21, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Second, we have the test of persistence. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is one of the most difficult expectations. In 1 Timothy chapter 4.16, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to continue in the ministry of teaching and preaching God's Word. Now, this is difficult because ministry deals with people, and people are difficult creatures to deal with. Look at verses 12 to 13a. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and the door stood open for me in the Lord, I had no peace in my spirit. So Paul sends Titus to Corinth to find out how the Corinthian Christians were responding to Paul's exhortation. 
You see, the plan was, Titus will meet Paul in Troas. So when Paul went to Troas, a door of ministry was opened for him there. Yet he had no peace in his spirit because he didn't find Titus there. See, Titus was delayed. And so Paul had no idea what the Corinthian Christian's attitude is towards him at this point. And that emotional burden is one of the things that make ministry difficult. In addition to the pressures of ministry, we have to deal with our own emotional well-being. Even as we build relationships with the people who sometimes don't listen to what we preach or sometimes misunderstand us. I can tell you right now, pastors are one of the most misunderstood people in the world. And sometimes we deal with people who are difficult to deal with. As a pastor, I have felt that. Sometimes I question myself whether I push the people too much in my preaching. And I also have to deal with the balance of whether I should reach out to people who do not show up for a couple of Sundays. Because sometimes when I do that, I get misinterpreted. But the church needs to understand that follow-up is a job of my pastoral ministry. You know, if you think about it, we call into our work if we can't make it. So why not check in with the pastor if you can't make it to the Sunday service or the Bible study? See, I think the church forgets that the church is not an organization. Rather, it is the body of Christ. As a local church, we ought to do life together. That's how they did it in the early church. They did life together. And meeting once a week is not doing life together much less not letting the pastor and the brethren know why you're no longer coming to the church. Despite of the difficulty of ministering to people, we pastors must complete the ministry God called us to do. Colossians 4.17 says, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. If you as a pastor are feeling discouraged, Change the name Archippus to your name and read it out loud with your name. And I'm going to do just that. Tell Kirby, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. Our persistence will also be tested because we need to learn to trust the direction of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13b says, So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Now did Paul just leave the open door of ministry God had just opened for him? No. If you read Acts 16, 9 to 10, it was during this time that the Lord directed Paul to go to Macedonia by way of a dream to preach the gospel there. Perhaps Paul wanted to stay a bit longer in Troas to wait for news from Titus. But in the end, he had to follow the leading of the Lord. And sometimes as pastors, we have to set aside our own emotional health for the sake of the work. And sometimes, and many pastors will agree with me, right or wrong, we often neglect our own families. We should not, but we do. That too is the price we have to pay in doing the Lord's work. Sometimes we are sad and lonely because we do not know how the people we minister to feel about us. Regardless, we must go on. My encouragement to myself and to other pastors who happen to hear this on YouTube is to persist and trust in the direction of the Holy Spirit. Because as Zechariah 4.6, it is not by our might or by our power, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord of hosts. So it is an expectation for us pastors and ministers of God's Word to persist in the ministry despite the difficulty involved and to persist in the ministry by trusting in the direction of the Holy Spirit. Third is the test of resilience, according to verses 14 to 16. Pastors, we need to be resilient in the ministry because God's grace is sufficient for us, for Christ's power is perfected in weakness. Of course, this is easier said than done. I often find myself experiencing the message of what I have to preach before I preach it. And sometimes I ask the Lord, why? And the answer is simple. Because when Christ Jesus our Lord called us to pastoral ministry, He called us to a life of suffering. Let's read verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us 
triumphantly as captives in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. Now, in this picture that the Apostle Paul was painting, I want you to notice that the one who captured him and leading him triumphantly is none other than the Lord. Let's get that straight first and foremost. Jesus is the victor who is leading the Apostle Paul triumphantly as his captive to be displayed for others to see. And as we say yes to the calling of the ministry, the Lord himself, as his captive, is going to strip us of ourselves, of our flesh, in order to glorify himself through us. And that is why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 to 11, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always consigned to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal body. And not only is the Lord stripping us of ourselves for His glory, He does that to encourage His church at our expense. Let's read verses 15 to 16. For we are to God the sweet aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an odor of death and demise. To the other, a fragrance that brings life. And who is qualified for such a task? Did you see that? Our sufferings as pastors becomes a sweet aroma for other Christians, for the people we minister to. And this is really hard because if I were to paraphrase the scripture, it would say the Lord has captured us and is refining us as a testimony of his power for others to see. In other words, the church is benefiting from our refinement. The church's blessing is at our expense. No wonder the Apostle Paul asked the question, and who is qualified for such a task? 2 Corinthians 4.12 reads, So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in the people we minister to. So pastors, we must be resilient in suffering for Christ and in suffering for the church we minister to. Lastly, we are expected to be diligent in our pastoral ministry according to verse 17. 1 Peter 5 2 reminds us to serve the body of Christ, not out of greed, but out of eagerness, out of diligence for the sake of Christ. Verse 17a tells us that we are expected to serve the Lord's body at a loss. Verse 17a reads, For we are not like so many others who peddle the word of God for profit. To be honest, there is no money in being a pastor. To be sure, there are some pastors who enjoy a pretty comfortable salary. But for most pastors, there is no money in it. I am a bivocational pastor by choice because I don't want to burden the church. And I want to be able to identify with people I serve that I also know what it is like to have a job. I know what it is like to deal with the world. That is not to say I am against full-time pastors. There is nothing wrong with being a full-time pastor. But the point I'm making is simply this, that there is no money in the ministry, even though serving full-time are probably not getting paid what they are due. Nevertheless, let us continue serving the Lord with our best, even though there is nothing to be gained financially because Jesus lost his very life for us. And perhaps our examples will inspire the church to also serve each other at a loss. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.8, More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. And we also should serve the church with our best. Verse 17 b reads, On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity as men sent from God. Even if your congregation is small, always deliver your best sermon as the Spirit leads you, because we do it for the Lord, first and foremost. 2 Timothy 2.15, make every effort to present yourself approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the word of truth. So the test or expectation of diligence in our pastoral ministry requires us to serve the church, even at a loss, and to serve the church with our best. So we looked at the 
four expectations or tests required in pastoral ministry. And that is the test of obedience, the test of persistence, the test of resilience, and the test of diligence. And who is qualified for such a task? The answer is no one. But here is the great thing. It is our Lord Jesus Christ himself who qualifies us to do that which no one is qualified to do. And praise be to his holy name. One thing that I desire